Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 18, and then reading through chapter 6, verse 5. To feel God's pleasure. Um, it's an interesting concept, to feel God's pleasure. Often we, we would say to feel God's presence. But I wanted us to think about how that God is alive and God is touching our lives, and how that we find his presence pleasurable. It is a pleasure, it is pleasing for us to be in his presence. So Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 18. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us all... Just as one person did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. He's referring to Adam and Christ. As in Adam all die, as in Christ all are made alive. Verse 20. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, but that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. A life that goes on and on and on, world without end. Then chapter 6. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in the old house? I like that. If we've, lived, if we've left the country where sin abides in our house, you know, sin is in that life, how can we now live in that house if we've left that country? Or don't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind, and we came out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life and a new land. That's what baptism unto the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up, out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light field world by our Father so that we can see where we are going in our new grace sovereign country. We are raised into a light field world. Wow. You know, too often we look at life and we look at things in what appears to be a very logical arena. You know, we're guided by the belief that good is the opposite of bad. Mankind has, for centuries, pursued the idea of finding fault or fault-finding. And then after we see that, we, if we put the evil or the bad out there, sooner or later we will learn not to do it. It appears logical that, and this, this whole philosophy appears to be so logical, that doctors study disease in order to learn what healthy life is. Psychologists have investigated sadness in order to learn about joy. Therapists have looked into the cause of divorce in order to learn about happy marriages. And in many ways, all of us have been encouraged to identify and analyze and correct our weaknesses in order to find strength. This advice is well intended, but it's really mis mis misguiding. Now, I know faults and failures and, de and deserve to be studied. You know, there's reasons that people do what they do. And these are important to study, but they reveal little bit, uh, very little about strengths. So if I were up here and I'd say, okay, you come up here and we're, gonna, we're going to um, constructively criticize all of your faults. Okay, so you come up here and you stand and everybody gets to take a shot at you with everything that's wrong with you. How many volunteer for that one? <laughs> no. Well, after we're done, after we're done with that whole idea of finding fault, do we feel encouraged? 
Do we feel like we've accomplished something? Is there good finally going to come of all this discovery of everything that is wrong? And the answer is no. Because looking for and finding faults and being critical doesn't empower us to become stronger. It only eats away at us and we become even more critical. You see, fault findings deserve study, but we don't get our strengths from our faults. Strengths have their own pattern. Strengths about our life and about our character have a whole different pattern in our life than our weaknesses and our sins. So the church at Rome had the concept, if God loves to forgive sin, let's keep on sinning. Yeah, let's make God happy. Let's continue. If God loves to forgive, let's find a way that God can continue to forgive. Let's keep on sinning. Well, Paul's saying in verse, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, what should we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old houses there? So if we have been forgiven, we can't go live where our sin is. We can't go on living that life that continues to destroy us. So this section here in chapter 6 from verse 1 to chapter 8, verse 39, is a section that deals with what we call sanctification, the separation of ourselves from sin. It's separation from our sin and our life of sin to a righteous life. So to look over or to look at what sin is so that we may know what righteousness is doesn't work. Hmm. To identify and analyze and correct our sin in order to become righteous is what the law tried to do. The law said, you know, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't, don't bear false witness, don't lie. Well, we have all of those things in our laws. Why didn't our, our society, and the society of, of Judaism and, and, and um, the Old Testament, why didn't it work? We knew what the laws were, but yet we were still breaking them. And yet the, in our life, the lifestyle didn't change, and Jesus had to come and tell them, you fulfilled the law in your outward things, but you really haven't changed. In Romans chapter 8, verse 3 says, For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son. So our nature is that inner part of us that kind of controls what we do, where we go, what we say, our actions, and things like that. And when Christ forgives us, he changes our nature. He changes that inward person that no longer desires to find salvation in our actions, but finds forgiveness in Christ. That when Christ came to give us life, his blood became the sacrifice for our sin. And his body on the cross was the sacrifice for our sin. His death became the atonement that the price was paid for our sin so that we could find forgiveness and restoration. And we say we're restored, that he purchased our salvation. Well, when were we lost? Well, we go back to as in Adam, all die. In the garden, God created us, created mankind, man and woman, he created us to walk with him, to be his friend, that we would be a friend with God. And God came down in the cool of the day and walked with Adam and Eve, and they were as, you know, a friend with friend. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they fell, they broke the commandment of God, God gave them one commandment, don't eat of the tree, this one tree. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you'll die. Well, Adam and Eve uh, broke that command. They ate of the, the tree, and they died. They died spiritually. They died physically. Because in that, in that garden was also the tree of life. And the tree of life, God said, you can eat of this tree, but they never did. They looked and went to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were tempted, and they succumbed to that temptation, and they died, physically and spiritually. They found themselves estranged from God. 
When Jesus Christ came and died upon the cross, he purchased back that which we had lost. He intended us to live forever, and he intended us to walk with him as a friend. So in that salvation that Christ purchased for us on the cross, reinstates us to that place that we were supposed to have from the very beginning. A place of forgiveness, a place of restoration, a place of walking with God. And so if we think that we are going to walk with God by correcting all of our bad faults, and that we can, we can look at all of our faults and find somehow a way to God, it doesn't work. We, ha- we look at how Christ has come and he has purchased our salvation, and we look at what God's intention was at the very beginning. His intention was that we not sin. His intention was that we would walk with him as a friend, and that he would walk with us. So here is this idea that we are supposed to walk with God, but in chapter 8 says, for what the law, the law came and pointed out all of the things that are wrong. These are, the, these are the Ten Commandments. Don't break them, and you'll find yourself headed in the right direction. But what happened was, we couldn't do it. Jesus said, you know, the law says don't commit adultery, and Jesus says if you've looked at someone and you've, you know, desired them, you've committed a sin. He said, if you have stolen from someone, that's a sin. But if you covet your neighbor's stuff to the point that you, you, know, you can't get away from thinking about it, you've sinned. So the nature that we have inside of us is that where God is coming to our life to help us so that we can overcome these things. Spiritually, what we cannot measure by our own logic and reasoning, God has done in Jesus Christ. So when it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. Grace, God's favor to you. Grace is God's favor to you. You can't earn it. You can't make him love you. You can't make him change. You can't make his change his heart, his mind. His, 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 his nature is to love you. The nature of God is that God has never had one bad thought about you, about us. His grace is that his divine favor rests upon you. God's divine favor rests upon your life. You know, we look at things and we, you know, logically and, you know, we're running through our life. Well, you know, if I just had this or if I just had that, I could make it. Well, what if we had the favor of God? What if we had the divine favor of God as invested in our life? Could we make it? All things are possible to him who believes. And the answer is, yes, we can make it because the favor of God rests upon us. You see, we look at the law and we read it and it says, thou shalt not. And whenever we see this, thou shalt not, we become experts in condemnation. It's easy to convict a murderer. It's easy to convict a thief, an adulterer, a liar. It's easy to convict. It's easy to pass judgment on people. But Christ didn't come to pass judgment on us. So why should we be passing judgment upon ourselves? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who, who, who don't walk after the flesh but after the Spirit. There's no condemning nature. That Christ's nature in us is not about what is wrong with you, but what's right with you. God forgives us of our sins and then he works in our life to bring about his relational experience where we find life into the, the scriptures talk about, what is it, the light-filled world? That we live in this light-filled world of our Father. There is no darkness in Him. There is no hiding from God. Adam and Eve, after they, after they broke God's commandment, they were hiding in the bushes. And God says, Adam, where are you? As if he didn't know where he was at. <laughs> Adam, over here, God. <laughs> like, you know, he's hiding, and God didn't know it. He was just asking him, calling him out. 
because he wanted Adam to respond to his voice. Hmm, like us. How do we respond to God's voice? How do we respond to the things that he calls us to do? So it's easy for us to be, to stand in condemnation, to try and convict people. Anybody ever watch the news? (laughs) Does the uncovering of all of these wrongdoings change our society? (laughs) Does the uncovering and the reporting of all of the bad stuff change us? Every night... We have the news at 5, 5.30, 6, 6.37. We have it at 11, 10, early news, 10.30 if you get Chicago's network. You know, we have all of the news and all this uncovering of all the things that have gone wrong in our society, in our surrounding areas, and in our world. We have all this news. Does it change anything? Does it change the nature of us watching it? Maybe you say, well, I'm not that bad. Wow, look at those people. Look what they did. Look how they harmed someone. But does the nature of our society change because of the news? And the answer is? I say, what do you think the answer might be? I don't know. What do you think it might be? This is a trick question. Pastor's trying to fool us now. (laughs) Does our society change by watching the news? And the answer is no. It doesn't stop us. It doesn't stop our society. All the police force will be dismissed because we have finally found that if we report all the bad things, people will quit doing them. (laughs) No, it doesn't work. Paul says, well, well, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, for if we live according to the sinful nature, we will die. And it's easy to find what's wrong in our sinful nature. Because we have found that the sinful nature expresses itself in a way that generally is hurtful, it is derogatory, it is separation, it is separating us from one another, and it is exclusive. We start putting ourselves in a society where we are not as bad as others. And all of this goes on and and nothing changes. Hmm. For if we live according to the sinful nature, we will die. But if, the, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. If by the Spirit, this is the Spirit of God. God's Holy Spirit comes to make real to us the Scriptures and to empower us, each one of us, to live a Christian life in which we will be changed from the inside out. So we do not look to the sins of our failures or our failures to find the good things in life. We don't look to our failures to find good. It it seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? That we would look to what is wrong to figure out what right is. We look to what right is in Christ and in the scriptures, to find out what we can become. And how that God wants to do a work in our life that we were created for a purpose. We have a, God has a plan for our life. God has a plan for each life and a purpose for each person. And that purpose is found in the life and the love of God, not in the condemnation and the guilt that we're going to guilt you into something. Guilt is a manipulator. Love is a leader. (laughs) Guilt manipulates us. God doesn't manipulate us. God loves us. He leads us. The scripture says that we are his sheep and and that we hear his voice and we follow him. We follow his love. We follow the path of of his righteousness. God's intent for us is to shift our focus to shift our focus from self, from shall we keep on sinning, to chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. It says, all that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. 
But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. Sin doesn't have a chance when it's matched against grace. So when we focus on God's grace and God's mercy to us, our faults and our failures can't compete. We have to let him go. We have to accept God's grace. We have to un- accept God's unmerited favor and love towards us. See, when it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, but that's the end of it. Grace because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah. And he invites us into life. In Christ, we are invited into life. Eternal life. Life here in the present. That you shall find life and have it more abundantly. You shall find greatness in your life in Christ. And how that God will work through you, through the Messiah. A life that goes on and on, and on, and on, and on. You know, I, I work, um, I don't know what call it work, I, I, I'm in a hospice a lot, and a lot of individuals are in the last days of their life, but it's, it's always easier when people have a faith that their life is going to go on after they cease breathing. After their life stops, they they, they don't fear it because of a life that is coming, a life that they have in God. And that life is the life that we have here and now. We have life in God that has begun The moment we confess our sins, we have an eternal life that has begun in Christ that God wants to do a work in us while we are still here. God is not looking for the weakness. He's not looking for the sin in our life. He's not looking for your failures. You know, there's this old plaque said, the eyes of God are upon you. Okay? The eyes of God are upon you. Okay? Now, do you think of that as God's up there marking down all the bad things? Or is it that he loves me so much he can't take his eyes off of me? (laughs) He loves me so much he can't take his eyes off of me. You see, we are raised into a light-filled world by our Father. So we can see where we are going in our new grace-sovereign country. Grace-sovereign country. The movie... um, Chariots of Fire. One of the scenes involves a conversation between the Scottish Olympic runner Eric Lydell. Is it Lydell? Lydell. L-I-D-D-E-L-L. Lydell? Little. Lydell. That's what it is. And his sister Jenny. Lydell attempts to explain to her why he is postponing his missionary deployment to run in the Olympics. God made me for a purpose, Lydell is saying. He made me for a purpose. China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. When I run, I feel his pleasure. That sense of feeling the smile of God, the wind in your sail, that sense of privilege to get to do something, the feelings that you are doing what you were born to do, These are the signs, the telltale signs, that God is at work in our life. And it isn't found and isn't discovered through finding fault. It's through finding place and purpose and the smile of God, as it were, upon our life. As we go about the tasks of living and going about our daily routines, we develop a talent consciousness we develop a talent consciousness that when we do certain things, it's like, this is what I am for. This is what I am here for. This is my purpose. You know, when I run, Lydell says, when I run, I feel his pleasure. When I, for me, when I speak, 
It's like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And now, strengths aren't necessarily what we're good at, and weaknesses are not what you are bad at. Okay? We can't look at everything we're good at at one point in our life and say, this is my talent. Because there is a calling in our life that God has. You know, I remember whenever I said I was, you know, I was going to Bible school and I was going to be a minister and all that. People said, wow, that's good. You must be able to speak. I said, no, can't do that. I said, well, are you going to be a minister if you can't speak? I don't know, but I know that that's God wants me to be a minister. Well, you know, I know I've told you the story that my, that in college in West Virginia, the, the youth group, the youth group, the, uh, they asked me to speak, and they gave me 20 minutes, and I took four. <laughs> I know all of you were praying for that to come back, but uh, <laughs> will, he, will he ever learn to speak for four minutes again? No. But anyhow, uh, you know, so they figured it was a mistake, so I, they had me speak again. That time I went for three minutes, and uh, I was done, and it's like, you're not really going to be a preacher, are you? <laughs> And, but I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And after I graduated from you know, Bible school and we went to this mission place in Maine and we stayed there for about two years and we came back and we started, a, started a, you know, to, I went to try out at a church and they were trying to decide if they wanted me to come for a whole week of meetings so that they could determine whether I was good enough to be their pastor. And my prayer was, God, I only have three sermons. <laughs> How could I ever speak for five days? My goodness, it scared me half to death. And it took me four or five days to write one message that was 15 minutes long. You know? So if you had looked at, if I had looked at that, I would say, I'll never be a, a speaker. I'll never be able to stand in front of people. But yet there was a calling, and that's where I felt his smile. God's pro- presence, God's pleasure. And you see, it wasn't built on what I couldn't do. It was built upon what I felt God wanted me to do. And God has called each of us. Each one of us has a divine calling. And it's what we, we may be doing it and, you know, working and, and it's what we feel good at. And it's what we feel purpose that God smiles at. I put stripes in my yard. You know, and people, come, why do you got stripes in your heart? And I think, well, maybe it looks good to God. <laughs> you know, I, I like putting stripes in my yard and I like my grass to be green. It doesn't matter if people see it. It matters, maybe it's a, maybe God likes straight lines, I don't know. But it's just something that you feel good about. And each one of us have those areas of our life. And it's not built on what's wrong with you. It's built upon what you look at. Now, uh, uh, you came home from school and everyone, all those who were in school had report cards and grades. Now, I don't have any kids to do this with, but I did it. I know I did it. Did you look for the lowest grade and say, what happened here? How many, how many had that happen? Yeah, parents? You looked at that, look at this, you got all A's in this one B. What is wrong with you? <laughs> no, what's right with you? <laughs> Why don't we look at all of the A's and forget the one B? We look at our life and we look at us and how often do we do that very same analogy? Look what's wrong with you, David. You know, look what's wrong with your life and what's, you know, when are you going to get the... It isn't what's wrong with your life. It's what's right with your life. And it's where the strengths are is where you're going to excel, not in your weaknesses. We're going to excel in our strengths, and some strengths we don't know we have just yet. I never thought that I would be able to be a speaker, a public speaker, but I love to do it. I'd love to speak. Sometimes too long, but I love to speak. <laughs> but... When I was 18, that was not a strength that I had. But it was something that I knew that I had to do. And that when I did it, I felt that that was where God wanted me to be. So then it became my responsibility, and with God's help, to develop it. 
And you see, that's what we find in what God is doing in our life. God smiles in our life when we are doing certain things. And it doesn't come from the law of what's wrong with you. It comes from what's inside of you, the nature that God has for you, the nature that God has put in you. And when we unite our nature with the nature of Christ, he forgives us of our sins, all of those things that would drag us down. Don't you remember this failure? Don't you remember? There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemning nature to a Christian. Satan is the accuser of you. God is the one who says, this is the gift I've put in you. This is the gift that I have for you. Walk in my spirit and in my strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says, this is Paul's thorn in the flesh, and I'll close with this. Because of the extravagance of those revelations, Paul had had, you know, we read Paul's writings, and sometimes we, we look at them and um, we say, wow, how did he learn all this stuff? Paul had a revela revelations from God. The disciples, the other disciples didn't tell Paul what happened on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. Paul had a revelation of it, and he told the disciples what had happened that night, because Paul had a revelation from Christ. And so he had many of these things going on in his life, and he talks about them. Because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so that I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angels did his best to get me down. Paul had an accuser. It was a, you know, he called it Satan's angels that always would try to get him down. Do you ever feel yourself being pecked at to the point of getting down on who you are and down on life and down? Hey, don't pay attention to that. Paul says they were there to get me down. But what he, in fact, was pushing me to my knees. He turned that pecking, as it were, to a point of which he went to his knees and he began to pray. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that. And then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My grace is enough. Grace, God's favor to you. My strength comes into its own. Speaking of God. God's strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began to appreciate the gift. Paul says, I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. That's the whole message. Quit focusing on your handicaps and start looking at your giftings because we all have them. We all have handicaps. We all have giftings. Everyone. Quit focusing on the handicaps and began to appreciate the gifts. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. That's what Paul said. It was Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. So as we look at our life, <laughs> you know what? We're not all perfectly round. Some of us have been working at it, but we're not all perfectly round. We're kind of oblong because there are things that we do in our life that are average. There are things that we do in our life that are just plain can't do. I can't sing. Don't try to. I just kind of mouth the words and I shut the mic off and everybody's happy. You know, I can't sing. It just isn't there. But like every one of us, there are things that we do average, there are things that we do very poor, and there are things that we can excel at. And that's God's gift to you for your life, for the body of Christ, for the world. You see, the Bible says that we are peculiar people, not strange people, but people who are set aside with a purpose. 
We are not motivated by what's wrong. God is not focused on how bad you are. God's grace focuses on the giftings that he has placed in your life where you can excel and God's grace can empower and it takes on a new dimension. And in the um, scriptures this morning, there was a word called ensembled, ensembled, E-N-S-E-M-B-L-E-D. And what it meant was, if you take a hammer and you miss the nail and hit the wood, it leaves an indent. Our lives are an ensemble, an impression of God's mercy and grace everywhere we go. Our giftings have that purpose, to make an impression everywhere we go. Shall we stand? <laughs> so, look at each other. Look around. Tell you, you know what? You're peculiar. <laughs> You're set apart for a purpose. You have a purpose. God has a gift in you. And it may not be developed yet. It may be in its infant state. But it's where you find God smiling at you. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs>